Anybody remembers it? You remember it? And it's kind of a dull weekend, then, huh? Okay, so um, I made an addition of one more uh, techni technique technology to the um, uh, PowerPoints from last time. So uh, if you've downloaded those previously, you may want to re-download so you can see what I've got on here. What I wanted to add was something about Western blotting. So Western blotting is a, a technique that allows us to identify and to a limited extent quantitate the amount of protein or the location of a protein on a gel. That can be very useful. Uh, and I'm not going to go into the reasons why that might be useful, but you can imagine being able to say that band is this protein which could be helpful to you. Um, so I want to just briefly go through uh, the way the method works. I'm not going to go into it in much detail. It's a fairly complicated technique. Uh, but it relies on, uh, of course, uh, gel electrophoresis since it is a way to identify something in a gel. So if you had a protein that you was in a mixture of other proteins and you weren't, for example, let's say, uh, sure of what size it was, you would separate it on a gel. And you would look at this gel and you'd see all these proteins that are there and you'd say, well, is my protein there? How much of it's there, etc." So Western blotting allows you to identify that protein. So um, there's really several steps of the process. They're depicted on the screen. I'm going to sort of step you through it, but like I say, I'm going to go through it uh, fairly quickly. The first step in the process, of course, is doing a polyacrylamide or SDS page uh, to um, separate the proteins in your mixture. The second step in the process involves transfer of those proteins out of the gel and onto a membrane. Now there's the, a variety of ways for doing this. The most commonly used one is as you see on the screen where you have use an electrical current to pass through the gel. So you take the gel that you run, you lay it on this um, surface through which you can pass electricity. And by driving electricity through the gel, what happens is the proteins that are in the gel move now onto the membrane in the exact locations that they were on the gel that you had run. So you've transferred at that point the proteins to the membrane, and you affix those proteins so they stick to the membrane. That's pretty critical because transferring them and not sticking them wouldn't uh, help very much. And at that point, you have a membrane now that is basically an image of that gel that you had run. In the next step of the process, this is where it gets a little bit more complicated, and this is where I'm going to simplify for your purposes. We use an antibody to identify the protein of interest. So let's say that you've been interested in a DNA polymerase. You could inject a bunny rabbit with that DNA polymerase. Let's say it's a, a polymerase from humans, for example. And the rabbit's immune system would make antibodies against that DNA polymerase because it wouldn't be its own DNA polymerase. It would be a foreign protein. You could collect those antibodies, and this is a completely uh, uh, harmless process to the rabbit. And you would have antibodies now against uh, DNA polymerase that you're studying. Okay? You could then take and, uh, in, uh, using some sophisticated techniques, what I will say, label those antibodies so that, for example, they have color or produce light or some kind of indication about where they are. Okay, so that's going to be important when we try to identify where they are on a gel. Now, as I said, it's a little bit more complicated than that, but suffice it to say we have a labeled antibody. We then take this labeled antibody and we put it on the surface of the gel. We allow it to find the protein that it binds to, because that's what antibodies do, is they recognize and bind to specific structures. And we wash away the unhybridized antibody, and then we expose that membrane looking for either the color or the light being produced or whatever it is that's the indicator of where that antibody is. And so with that, we can see specifically which band on a gel corresponds to the protein of interest or if there's none at all. Okay. So it would be very helpful information for us as we're doing, for example, in isolation or trying to understand where a protein is made. We might find, for example, that a certain protein is made in liver but not made in bone. And using this technique, I could tell that fairly readily. OK, questions about that? Kind of a brief synopsis, but I did want you to get uh, a chance to, to understand what Western blotting was about. Yeah? So just like before, the question is, for the current to go through the membrane, 
is it negative to positive, et cetera. So you're going to use the negative to repel. Positive is going to be underneath. And the, the proteins are just going to go in the direction of the positive. Yep. Just like they were in the original gel. Except for now they're going 90 degrees. Instead of running down the gel, they're going to go through the gel. Okay, well, that finishes what I wanted to say about the technologies. So let us get out of that and turn our attention to enzymes. So I'm going to spend about three lect lectures talking about enzymes. I have people asking me already where the exam material is going to end. It's usually around enzymes. I haven't decided exactly where that stop point will be yet. So by Friday, we should have a pretty good idea. Well, enzymes, of course, you know, are proteins that catalyze reactions. And the reactions that they catalyze are absolutely incredible. I've used the word magic several times, and it's with, ma it's with enzymes that I say magic actually seems to occur. It doesn't occur, but it seems to occur. Look at this, OK? When we look at a variety of proteins, what this is showing us is the speed enhancement of various enzymes. Look at the top one, an enzyme called OMP decarboxylase. OMP decarboxylase is an important enzyme in the synthesis of pyrimidine nucleotides. For the reaction that occurs in the synthesis of pyrimidine nucleotides, okay, the same reaction in the wild takes a ha has a half-life of 78 million years. In the presence of an enzyme, that reaction has uh, a uh, half-life I'm sorry, it has a, a half-life of about making 39 per second, okay? We go from an uncatalyzed rate of 28 times 10 to the minus 16th, okay, to 39 per second. That is a, a, that is a rate enhancement of 1.4 times 10 to the 17th. That's 140 quadrillion times. And a quadrillion is 1,000 trillion. This is an amazing enhancement. It's an amazing enhancement. A chemical catalyst, by comparison, if it speeds things up a thousand fold, is a pretty darn good chemical catalyst. Here's a protein catalyst that's speeding things up 10 to the 17th. This isn't even the best enzyme. The best enzyme for, chem for catalysis is actually superoxide dismutase, which enhances its reaction on the order of 10 to the 22nd. That's 100,000 time, 100, times faster than this one mind-boggling. It tells us that, boy, there's really something that's happening at the nanoscopic level that doesn't make any sense out here in the macroscopic world that we live in. We'll see that over and over. You might look at carbonic anhydrase, which is at the bottom of that chart. Carbonic anhydrase has a rate enhancement of about 7.7 .7 times 10 to the 6, about 7.7 .7 million. Pretty darn good. But what's incredible for that enzyme is its turnover rate. Where it says catalyzed rate there, you see that it says 1 times 10 to the 6th. That means that each molecule of that enzyme is catalyzing the synthesis of 1 million molecules of product per second. 1 million molecules of product per second per enzyme. There's nothing in the macroscopic world that we can point to where we have a million of those things occurring per second. The nanoscopic world is pretty amazing. When we think of an enzyme, this is the way I think of an enzyme, and probably the way that you think of an enzyme. These lights are a little obnoxious, aren't they? No. No. That's a little better, OK. So this glare is just as bad. OK, this is the way I think of an enzyme. We can see that sort of schematic uh, ribbon diagram of the protein part of the enzyme. You see the ribbons there. You see the white parts that are those, those random coils that we talked about and those uh, reverse turns that we talked about. And in the middle of that enzyme, we actually see uh, the, the reaction being catalyzed. Okay. The molecules that the reaction gets catalyzed on are known as substrates. They're the molecules that the enzyme binds. And this enzyme has bound two substrates. I've got them marked in yellow on the screen. Okay? So the substrate is what the enzyme acts on. It's what the enzyme binds to. 
The active site of the enzyme is the place in the enzyme where the reaction is catalyzed. You see some overlap between that active site and the binding sites for the substrates. Okay. This illustrates the phenomenon a little better. This is a schematic representation of the enzyme known as lysozyme. And you can see the binding site for the substrates in blue. And you can see the active site, which is only a part of the binding site of the substrate. We can think of that active site as just a subset of the region of the molecule where the catalysis is occurring. We can see that in this figure, the left part of the molecule, there's no uh, reaction occurring, and that, that is just being held on to by the enzyme. So the substrate binding site overlaps with the active site, and the active site is the place where the reaction is occurring. Okay, well, let's think about what's happening in an enzymatic reaction, okay? So an enzymatic reaction, we can break it down into several steps, and I've, I've actually, this was actually one of my artistic endeavors, uh, put this together to help you to understand a little better what's happening uh, in an enzymatically catalyzed reaction. We see here uh, on the screen, of course, the enzyme uh, looking like this hand structure in green that I've got here. Okay? And we have two substrates. We have a substrate A and we have a substrate B. Now, as we will see, not all reactions have two substrates. Some reactions have one substrate. Imagine that an enzyme is binding to a molecule and splitting it in half. It would only have one substrate, only one thing it would bind, and two things that it would release, for example. But this one has two substrates. We see in the binding process that the substrate recognizes specific regions on the enzyme and binds to them. Or alternatively, we can say the enzyme recognizes the substrate at specific regions and binds to it. You can say it whichever way you wish. This forms what we call the ES complex, or the ES, E being enzyme, S being substrate, the enzyme substrate complex. Okay? Now, one of the things I've tried to emphasize in making this, these figures is to show you something is happening to the enzyme in this process. And I'll come back to that theme in a little bit, but I want you to look, notice the enzyme is basically an open hand like this. One substrate bound here, one substrate bound over here. That's really all that's happened at this point. Okay? Next, as they say in the trade, something happens. And the something that happens is the hand clenches down a little bit. Okay? The hand clenches down a little bit. That clenching down of the hand changes the orientation of the two substrates relative to each other. You know that as a result of bringing electron clouds into closer proximity or further away proximity, that we change the electronic environment in which they exist. And if we do it properly, then a chemical reaction will occur. And that's actually what's happening here. You can see the sort of orange burst that I put in the middle to indicate that a chemical reaction is occurring. And it's occurring, if you watch, with the lavender circle relative to the molecule on the right. This forms what we call the ES star complex. And you can think of the ES star complex as being the uh, moment or the time or the, 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 the instant in which that reaction is occurring. So the ES star complex is a complex that's in the middle of a reaction. Everybody got that? Okay, now, when the reaction has occurred, or when the reaction occurs, things change. And those things changing, you can see here that little uh, purple ball has now shifted from the molecule on the left to the molecule on the right, okay? So there's been a bond broken between the molecule on the left with the purple ball and a bond formed between the molecule on the right with the purple ball. As I see on the figure, part of A has moved to B, okay? So A has become C, and B has become D. A plus B created C plus D. Okay? A is not the same as it was. That's why we call it C. B is not the same as it started out, and that's why we call it D. Okay? The next step in the process is, it's called, uh, this is called the EP complex. It's called the EP complex because 
At this point, the C and D, that is the products, are still bound by the enzyme. The next step in the process involves the release of the products. Product C is released and product D is released. The enzyme at that point is free to bind more substrates. And you'll notice that the enzyme has gone back to its original state. It's no longer clenching. In order for the, subs, for the uh, products to be released, the, the, the clenching had to let go. They had to let go so that those substrates could go away. At that point, the enzyme is exactly the way it was before the reaction started. When we think about a catalyst, one of the things that's hammered into your head in freshman chemistry about catalysts is that catalysts speed reactions, but they are not changed in the process. A catalyst speeds a reaction without itself being changed. Enzymes bend that rule. Now, if the enzyme ended up being, uh, being changed in the end, it would not meet the criterion for being a catalyst. But by the end, the enzyme is exactly in the same state that it was when it started. In that sense, it does meet the criteria. The difference for an enzyme is what happens in the middle. The enzyme in the middle is being transiently changed. It's being transiently changed. And I want to really emphasize that point. How does an enzyme get transiently changed? Anybody? How did, how did the enzyme become transiently changed? What were the changes that happened to the enzyme? The what? Allosteric is something else. No. I just described it. What happened? The enzyme clenched, right? What does it take for an enzyme to clench something? Flexibility. We've talked about flexibility. We've talked about rotation of bonds. We know there's some limitations. The peptide bond doesn't rotate, but we know other bonds can rotate. And the rotation of those other bonds gives the enzyme flexibility. Really important. If you wanted, in fact, if I ask you on an exam, the reason an enzyme works so well compared to what a chemical catalyst is, one word, flexibility. chemical catalyst does not have the flexibility that an enzyme does. And because of that flexibility, enzymes become incredibly efficient and effective as catalysts. Okay? Questions? Yeah? If you have a given amount of enzyme and a given amount of substrate, can what? Can the amount of enzyme be depleted? Not by what I've shown you, OK? Because the enzyme ends up exactly as it started. So it starts in a certain state. It ends in that same state. Now, when you talk about depletion, there's a couple things that you can think about. And we'll actually talk about it relative to kinetics. Depletion could mean I'm breaking down the enzyme, and the enzyme isn't there, right? That could be depletion. That doesn't happen. The second could mean that I've got so much substrate that the enzyme is swamped and I have limiting amounts of enzyme. And that, if that's what you mean by depletion, that does occur. Because we can control how much substrate we add. We could add a ton of substrate to an enzyme, more than an enzyme could bind at once. And we'll see that's a consideration for understanding rates of enzymatic reaction. Does that answer your question? Other questions? OK. Well, um, P plus P, there we go. So there's the summary of everything there. All right. We see the free enzyme and the substrates are floating around. One of the things that, of course, has to happen is they have to find each other. And finding each other for some enzymes is the only limit, the only limit for their catalysis is how fast diffusion can happen. Now, diffusion happens incredibly fast, folks. In order for carbonic anhydrase to catalyze the formation of a million molecules of product per second, every one of those molecules is diffusing into the active site of that enzyme. So diffusion is a pretty amazing process. And when you think about enzymes whose only limit is diffusion, <laughs> 
think you got some pretty amazing enzymes, and we'll talk about those later. They're actually called perfect enzymes. Okay? So they first got to find each other. Finding each other is going to be a function of concentration. The more concentrated the substrate concentration is, the more likely it's going to bump into an enzyme. Another thing about the binding of the enzyme with the substrate that I want everybody to remember, and I sort of showed it to you on the screen, but I didn't tell you specifically, is that not only do enzymes bind molecules in specific ways. I saw that the one bound to the top and one bound to the bottom. I have specific binding sites for enzymes, but more importantly, the, the substrates are held in specific configurations. Very, very specific configurations. So that when the hand clenches, that purple part is always going to touch the other part of the other molecule. That's different from what happens either just bouncing around in solution or happening with a chemical catalyst. A chemical catalyst doesn't have a hand to hold on to stuff. Bouncing around in solution, you've got to, you can have two molecules that bounce into each other, but if they're in the wrong orientation, the tail end runs into the head, one, head end of the other one, for example, or side to side, those, not every bouncing into each other is going to be productive. It's not going to produce a reaction. But with an enzyme, those chances are taken away because the enzyme always binds them in the correct orientation and therefore ensures that the reaction will occur. Okay. Substrate binding. We have the reaction occurring, the ES the e star complex, the product formation with the EP complex. By that point, the product has actually already formed. And the release of the products, the hand lets go, and the products go flying away. Okay. Well, um, we'll talk next week, actually, about serine proteases. Serine proteases are one class of enzymes. And uh, what we see about enzymes are several things. First of all, as I've been alluding to, they have binding specificity. Binding specificity, meaning a couple of things. One, Enzymes won't bind any molecule. They bind molecules with specific configurations, specific shapes. An enzyme might bind ATP, but might not bind CTP. Different shapes. An enzyme might bind ATP or GTP, but not CTP. So there may be ranges, OK? But they're usually not very wide ranges in terms of their binding site. And that's because the binding site has a specific 3D, con uh, 3D configuration. And the molecule that it's binding has a specific 3D configuration. They have to fit together. The glove has to fit on the hand. Enzymes, as I've said, are flexible. Okay? Flexible. We talk about specific structures. But in fact, an enzyme I like to think of as breathing. It's not denaturing, okay? But it's sitting there having small motions that are possible within it as it's just floating around in the solution. Breathing. Enzymes provide electronic environments that change. The electronic environment we saw changing happen when those two substrates were brought into close proximity. Their electronic environment changed drastically such that the one purple ball moved from one substrate to the other substrate. Electronic environments are essential, of course, for chemical reactions. And enzymes frequently use coenzymes. These are other molecules or other atoms, like metals, that help the enzyme to perform the catalytic function. We saw in the case of hemoglobin that it used not a coenzyme, but a cofactor called heme. By the way, remember that hemoglobin is not an enzyme. Common misconception. Hemoglobin doesn't catalyze any reaction at all. Hemoglobin binds oxygen, and we'll see that, it, that its binding of oxygen is like that of an enzyme binding substrate, but it's not an enzyme. Hemoglobin and myoglobin are not enzymes. So like hemoglobin, enzymes use substrate, uh, use coenzymes to help them to catalyze a reaction. OK. Well, the flexibility really comes into play when we talk about this uh, uh, matter in front of us here. Okay, Substrate binding. Almost every one of you was taught in high school, and you probably got taught in college 
as well the lock and key nature of an enzyme and a substrate. And the lock and key model for an enzyme and a substrate, as you will see, is not very accurate. It might be a little accurate for the binding of the substrate, but it's completely inaccurate or completely undescriptive in terms of telling us how a reaction is catalyzed. You see on the screen the lock and key model. There's the enzyme. It's got the lock shape. There's the substrate. It looks like it has that exact same shape as well. And it binds to the complementary shape on the enzyme. Bang. It's really good at saying how it is that an enzyme binds a specific substrate. But it says nothing about how the reaction occurs. It tells us nothing about how an enzyme does what it does. Really, at this point, we can say magic happens. And much as I like to talk about magic, that's not a sufficient explanation for how this process occurs. Okay. Now, the lock and key model has been replaced long ago, actually, by a model called the Koshland induced fit or the Koshland mechanism. Okay. The Koshland mechanism says the following. It says that not only does an enzyme change a substrate, but a substrate also changes an enzyme transiently. An enzyme changes a substrate, which is what the Fisher lock and key model says. But the Koshland model goes further and says the substrate changes the enzyme transiently. Okay? Now we see that depicted on the screen here. I've got another slide in a minute that'll, sh that'll show it in another way. We see at the top the substrate, which has its same specific shape that, as it had on the left. But we notice that on the right, the enzyme that's bound doesn't have a substrate binding site that's identical to the substrate. We see that it's similar. And what we're seeing here visually is what the Koshland model is telling us. The substrate binding to the enzyme is changing the enzyme transiently on the binding. Why does that matter? Why would that matter? Why do you think that would matter for catalysis, anybody? Good speculation time. Why should tr changing the enzyme matter? What would changing the enzyme do? Yeah. So he says it could, it changing the structure of the protein, you could change the function of the protein. That's exactly right. That's one reason. How about another reason? might change the chemical situation inside. And uh, that's, that's uh, correct as well. And that actually is another way of saying what I was going to say. Okay? It creates a tension. Tension. Right? Imagine I have a spring that's sitting here. And when I bring a magnet near the spring, the spring bends in a way that it didn't bend before. Is there tension? You betcha. The spring wants to go back to the way it was, right? When I take away the magnet, what's going to happen? Boing, it's going to go back to the way it was. This is what's happening here. This could be electronic tension. This could be physical tension, meaning uh, the, um, uh, like pulling something apart, or pushing something together. Okay. A variety of ways of making tension. But the enzymes change on the binding of the substrate creates a change in the enzyme. And that change in the enzyme helps the reaction to be catalyzed. Yes? Is there tension because of the non-flexibility of the uh, peptide bond? Well, there can be tension for a variety of structural reasons. Okay, Not specifically that one, although that can be a factor in the overall process. But it doesn't have to be physical tension. It can be, as I said, electronic tension. You all of a sudden put a negative charge right next to another negative charge. That's electronic tension, right? You change the hydrogen bonding pattern for the inside of the enzyme. That's electronic tension, right? So a variety of kinds of tension that can happen, including physical and including what you said, but that's not the only way that we would have tension. shows the same process a little bit 
better, I think, in terms of visual image, but it's the same idea. The binding of the substrate is changing the enzyme. In this case, the enzyme is closing down on it. I'm going to talk a lot this term about an enzyme called hexokinase. Hexokinase is an enzyme that catalyzes the transfer of phosphate from ATP onto glucose. It binds ATP and it binds glucose. And the ATP is up here and the glucose is down here. And hexokinase is very flexible. And the binding of these two causes hexokinase to change its configuration. The change in configuration closes the jaws. The jaws come together. And as a, and as a result of that, the phosphate of ATP is brought immediately next to glucose. The phosphate hops over to glucose. The jaws open, and glucose 6 phosphate and ADP are released. The tension caused the jaws to come together. The change in the chemical reaction caused the jaws to open. All right? Bang, bang, the reaction happened. Question? Yes? Okay, good question. So, he says if the, if the substrate changes the enzyme and the enzyme has multiple subunits, do the reactions go one at a time or what? All right. In general, the individual subunits will have their reaction going independently of the others. However, the binding of one substrate may cause an T to R change like we saw in hemoglobin so that the binding actually changes, but the reaction won't. Okay. Good. Very good question. So the question was, if you have uh, one molecule binding instead of two, is it turned into two different products? Uh, it could be, it could not be, it could be a rearrangement. Okay. So it doesn't have to be a splitting in order for that to, to occur. We'll, we'll see some examples of that. Okay, this diagram I like. It energetically, oh, question. Uh, I'm not sure I understand. So the, the only reactions occurring is, is that which is uh, that occurring at the ES star. So the release of the uh, products is not a chemical reaction. Okay. Now, there may be chemical reactions in some cases that are involved in the release. We'll talk about some examples with serine proteases. But the, the reaction that we're talking about being catalyzed is that which is formed in the ES star. OK? OK. OK. Blah, blah, blah. There we go. All right, this figure shows how does an enzyme accomplish what it does. This is showing the energy profile of a reaction for a catalyzed reaction, or it could be an uncatalyzed reaction for that matter, but it's not an enzymatic reaction. Okay? So here's that reaction floating around these two molecules. We measure the energy of them. The free energy is plotted on the y-axis. The reaction progress is plotted on the x-axis. So we're just following it as the reaction goes along. We see that for the reaction to get started, there has to be an input of energy, and that input of energy ha is, has a certain value. We don't have to worry about what that value is, but we see it depicted on the screen. When the reaction occurs, then it goes downwards on the right side. And as it goes downwards, it finally reaches the energy of the products. And the energy of the products here less than the energy of the reactant, so the reaction is favorable. The barrier for this reaction is that initial energy, okay, called the activation energy. The activation energy is the barrier for this reaction to occur. Okay? It, it can go to the top, it can go forwards, it can go backwards. We can see that if we start at the bottom and we had to go back, it's possible, but boy, it's an even bigger barrier to get back over, right? Here's what an enzyme does. It lowers the activation energy. That's the only thing it does. 
from an energetic perspective. It lowers the activation energy. And that lowering of the activation energy has no effect whatsoever on the overall energy of the reaction. You'll notice that the enzymatically catalyzed reaction ends up at the same place. The products have the same energy as they had for the uncatalyzed reaction. There's no difference between the overall energy for an enzymatically catalyzed reaction compared to a catalyzed reaction. Plant that in your heads. You're going to want to believe otherwise, but it's not. Okay. That means, therefore, that the equilibrium of an enzymatically catalyzed reaction is exactly the same as the equilibrium for a catalyzed reaction. All that an enzyme does is it speeds the achievement of equilibrium. The reaction gets to equilibrium faster, but it doesn't change. Oh, now I've got more A than B. Whereas in the uncatalyzed reaction, I had more B than A. Nope, nope. The amount of A and B in the uncatalyzed reaction will be exactly the same as the catalyzed reaction at equilibrium. Okay? Make sense? Okay. So, summarizing. Enzymes lower activation energy. That's how enzymes speed reactions. They make it much easier for them to get to that state where they react than in the absence of the enzyme. Enzymes catalyze reversible reactions just like uncatalyzed reactions. All reactions are reversible. We'll find some examples in cells where there are some that are pretty difficult to reverse, but still theoretically reversible. Enzymes don't change reversibility. Enzymes do not change overall energy. Okay? Enzymes do not change equilibrium concentrations. I can't make more A or more B because I use an enzyme. Okay? Enzyme isn't going to change that amount. Enzymes, as I say, speed the achievement of equilibrium. Once you're at equilibrium, I'm not going to change it any further. Okay, well, to summarize what I've been saying about equilibrium, and I do this on purpose because I find that too many students have this idea that equilibrium means equal concentrations. If there's one idea I want you to banish from your head, that's it. Equilibrium does not mean that. Franklin Chemistry did not do you a good service in not hammering that home to you. It's not your fault. Freshman Chemistry needs to make sure you know what equilibrium means. At equilibrium, concentrations of reactants and products will not change. The forward reaction equals the reverse reaction. Here's A going to B. At equilibrium, at a given time T, the concentration of A will be equal to the same concentration five minutes later. Once I've reached equilibrium, the concentration of A is not going to change. Similarly, at equilibrium, the concentration of B is not going to change. Five minutes later, 10 minutes later, 20 minutes later. Okay? Those are not going to change. At any amount of time after equilibrium has been, been reached, the quantity of A is going to stay the same. Unless A is chemically unstable or something, it's going to stay the same. Not going to, not going to change. Similarly, the concentration of B is not going to change over time. And here's the hammer home point. Unless the delta G zero prime for a reaction is zero, we'll talk about delta G zero prime later, but unless it is zero, it is wrong to say at equilibrium that the concentration of A is equal to the concentration of B at equilibrium. That is not true. It's wrong to say that, and about a third of you are going to tell me that on an exam. I always hate when I tell you that a third of you are going to tell me, and then a third of you make me right. Don't make me right. Make me wrong. OK. So let's talk about reactions. There are several types of reactions to consider. I've talked about some of them already. Single substrate, single product. A goes to B. That could be an isomerization re relevant to your question over here. Right? A single could make multiple. A gets split into two molecules. A goes to B plus C. Multiple substrates. 
A plus B get joined together to make C. That's a fairly simple one. A more complicated one is multiple substrates, multiple products. Schematically, we could think of A plus B going to C plus D. Multiple substrates can occur in three types of reactions that we'll talk about in this class. One is ordered binding. The second is known as random binding. And the third is called ping pong, which is kind of cool. We get to play ping pong. Let's look first at ordered and random. Remember, we're talking about multiple substrate binding and multiple product formation. Here's an example of ordered binding. Lactate dehydrogenase catalyzes the reaction that you can see on the screen. NADH plus pyruvate goes to lactate plus NAD. That's an oxidation of pyruvate. I'm sorry, that's a reduction of pyruvate to make lactate. It's the other direction going upwards. It's an oxidation, sorry. It's a reduction of pyruvate to make lactate. Okay? This reaction requires NADH to bind first. If NADH does not bind first, this reaction will not occur. This tells us something really important. Remember the cochlean induced fit? The cochlean induced fit said the binding of a substrate transiently changes the enzyme. If we learn that one substrate hasn't, has to bind first, doesn't that tell us that the substrate is binding and the enzyme is changing so that the other one can bind? That's what this is telling us. This is the best evidence that you'll have in this class for the cochlean induced fit ordered binding of multiple substrates. You think, oh, OK, well, then all, all enzymes must bind substrates in order. Nope, they don't. Random binding occurs when either substrate can bind first. Doesn't matter. And then you say, well, does that mean the cochlean induced fit is wrong? Nope. It just means that the binding isn't affecting substrate sites. It could be affecting something else. So with random binding, it doesn't matter if creatine binds first, if it, ATP binds first, none of that matters. What matters is that they both bind and the reaction occurs. So we have random binding and we have ordered binding. Now the cool mechanism is ping pong. Ping pong is commonly displayed by many enzymes. One category of enzymes are known as transaminases. We'll talk about them later with respect to amino acid metabolism. And in this reaction, you can see the following things. There's two things that happen. First, we see the amine group on the molecule above, R1, moving to the amine group of R2 below. Similarly, we see the oxygen of R2 moving to R1. There's a swapping that's happening between the amine group and the oxygen. Both of those things have to happen in order for this reaction to occur. This schematically shows it. This is a little confusing because this reaction would be more like A plus C goes to B plus D instead of A plus B goes to C plus D. Yeah? So uh, the, the question is, uh, are ping pong reactions, ping pong mechanisms only occurring when these two functional groups are swapping? No. There are other enzymes. I just use that as an example. Okay? But in ping pong mechanism, what you're going to see in every case is like what I see on the screen. The enzyme is playing a role in that transfer and is being changed. It has two different states. In a ping pong mechanism, the enzyme has two different states. We see it above. A plus enzyme. In the, in the above state on the left, the enzyme is bound to an amine group. The enzyme gives the amine group to A, making B. And the enzyme picks up the um, uh, oxygen from A and now is an enzyme bound to oxygen. In the second step of the process, the enzyme bound to oxygen swaps with the amine on C to create D. Okay? And the enzyme is left back in the original state bound to the amine group. The two states of the enzyme was one, where one state was bound to oxygen, the other state was bound to amine. And the enzyme bounces back and forth between the two, literally ferrying oxygen and amine between the different molecules. Question. Yeah. Uh, so it shows A between the comparison between A and B apart from the double bond O. Okay. So he says the question here is A going to B. Is there a difference between A and B except for the double bond O and the amine group? There's no difference. You can see it here. 
Okay? So we see above the, the, the R1 and R2. The R1 has the amine group, and below the armine has the oxygen. On the top right, the R2 has the oxygen, and the below right, the R2 has the amine. Okay? So that's the only thing that's happening here, just swapping those two things. And the enzyme is facilitating that by existing in two states, as they say. Enzyme bound to amine or enzyme bound to oxygen. Pretty cool. It's ping pong. Watch ping pong. OK. All right, so here's what's happening. We saw this earlier with the binding of the, uh, the substrate by the enzyme. Okay. We see the guts part of what we're interested in is happening on the right side of the figure right here. We're interested in studying enzyme kinetics. We're interested in studying the rate of formation of product. I'll repeat that. In studying enzyme kinetics, we're going to be concerned with the rate of formation of product. We're going to define a velocity of an enzymatic reaction. And a velocity of an enzymatic reaction is the concentration of product formed divided by time. We'll talk about this on Wednesday, but that's what the velocity of a reaction is, the concentration of product form divided by time. All right, so we actually simplify this equation, assume that once we get the ES complex that we're going to form product, that's a simplification, and it gives us a constant, there's a variety of constants that appear there, the only one we're going to be interested in is this one, it's called kcat. kcat was that rate thing we saw on the very first slide of this presentation where we saw the different rates, we had a million per second, that's a kcat. And I'll talk more about KCAT next time, how that gets defined. OK, it's a lot of material. Today's song, There's No Way on Earth I Can Sing, I will encourage you, if you'd like to, to sing along with the singer. She's really awesome. Her name is Liz Bacon. And please join. Oh. Um. 
you guys.